I'm zooming to you from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the land on, um, on which I live and I work. And I'll get stuck into it. So my presentation is on Janet Cardiff's Forest Walk. And so in 1991, Janet Cardiff produced her first audio walk called Forest Walk, which marked her transition from printmaking and photography to sound walks and installations. And in the same year, she attended an artist residency at the Banff Centre for the Arts. Cardiff's adoption of sound and her residency in Banff were not coincidental. As she recalled to me in an interview, she said, Banff was an important time for me. I made my first walk work there. This paper emerges from research into the practice of Janet Cardiff and her partner and collaborator, George Burroughs Miller. And I will show you that the impact of the Banff Centre on Cardiff's production ran deeper than might have been anticipated. What is significant and to my knowledge hasn't been examined in any detail is the connection between the programming and the events at Banff in the late 1980s and the early 1990s and Cardiff's transition to spatial sound. I will explain how the convergence of electroacoustics, sound walking and acoustic ecology at Banff was formative in Cardiff's early experimentation with tape recordings and sound spatialization. Furthermore, this paper emphasizes the specificity of her technology. That is the multi-track analog tape. Sorry, there's two messages. Oh, okay. Sorry, there was two messages in chat that I was just reading. Let me, let me go back to that again. So I'm going to emphasize the specificity of her technology the multi-track analog tape, binaural sound, headphones, cassette Walkman and voice recorder. And these are all commonplace musical, music composition um, and new media materials of the time specifically. But these now antique technologies allowed her to manipulate analog tape in order to form layers in space. And these spatialization effects were identified by sound studies academic Jonathan Stern as supplements to existing physical and acoustic spaces. They simultaneously represent and construct space. So Cardiff's sound environments didn't compete with the existing physical space, but supplemented and overlaid the walker's experience. Cardiff's transition to sound was not marked by a serendipitous encounter with the illusionism of sound. It was a translation of already established methods of sound spatialization, of sound walking and listening practices. Consequently, Cardiff's experiments with analog sound revealed sound spatial and physical potential. And this was a prospect that was integral to Cardiff and Miller's practice over the following three decades. So in 1991, Cardiff attended a summer photography artist residency at the Banff Centre. And during this residency, she made postcard sized collage photographic works, like you can see here on the image, using a pinhole camera. Although she had been experimenting with sound for a few years, it wasn't until Banff that she specifically began experimenting with the Tascam recorder and binaural sound. Not only did the residency influ influence her path towards sound-based artworks, but a cycle of conferences, exhibitions and programs focused on electroacoustics, acoustic ecology, new media also made an impact. The Banff, the Banff Centre was decisive in the progress of new media and sound art in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And under the leadership of Michael Century, the Banff Centre and the Walter Phillips Gallery shifted programming to experimental media and electronic arts. This direction was spearheaded by a conference developed around sound and technology called Viewpoints on Arts and Technology in 1986. And the centre also hosted significant radio and sound programs, including the presentation of Murray Schaefer's experimental opera called Princess of the Stars in 1985, and the experimental radio broadcast project called Radar in 1989. 
There were also weekly art walks around the town of Banff. The guided walk stopped at Banff's cultural institutions, museums, and the old Banff Cemetery. Three conferences in particular, Convergence, CEC Electric, Electroacoustic Days at Banff in 1989, the virtual seminar on the bioapparatus in 1991, and Tuning of the World in 1993 were all important. The Convergence Conference in November of 1989 was a meeting of the acoustic ecology community, predominantly from the west coast of Canada, and the Canadian electroacoustic community from the east coast. And both these close knit these both close knit communities shared theories, approaches, and technologies and artworks. And this meeting was, according to Michael Century, it was the first time that the CEC had presented on the West Coast. Largely, the CEC composers were from Toronto and Montreal, and they explored electroacoustics and technology-based sound practices, while the Vancouver-based acoustic ecologists were focused on listening, preserving and documenting the soundscape. As part of Convergence, the then curator of the Walter Phillips Gallery, Diane Orgaitis, she invited the German sound artist Christina Kubisch to exhibit in Canada for the first time. Kubisch's impact on Carter for Miller was less by way of influence and more by way of the permission her example provided them in their pathway forward. Kubisch's impact, um, sorry, Kubisch's landscape um, included electrical cables that were suspended from the ceiling and illuminated with black fluorescent light. The dangling cables conducted electrical frequencies inaudible to the naked ear, but audible through custom-made wireless headphones. And she explained that, the, that she worked with opposing sounds by combining electromagnetic sounds and field recordings so that the field recording, sorry, sorry, so that sound fields overlapped and, um, and intersected. And so the walker became suspended in this threshold between these two separate cable fields as they navigated the texture of sonic relations, mixing sounds and frequencies. In February 1990, two months following landscape, Miller was in a group exhibition called Noise Under the Tongue also at the Walter Phillips Gallery. And then two years later, Cardiff developed her take on the sound walk called Forest Walk for the small forest area behind the Walter Phillips Gallery. Like Kubisch's walker, the walker in Forest Walk became entangled in intersecting zones between recorded and physical space. Rather than transmitting electromagnetic noise, Forest Walk was, com was composed of walking directions, narrative fragments, sound effects, field recordings, and other sound samples recorded in binaural audio. Forest Walk was the first of, of over 20 audio walks that Cardiff produced between 1991 and 2006. The audio walks were a series of installations where the walker donned headphones and followed a prescribed route while listening to a recording on cassette Walkman and a headset. The idea for Forest Walk was, as most good ideas are, stumbled upon by chance. Cardiff was walking through the Old Banff Cemetery, recording herself talking into a portable voice recorder. And at one stage, she unintentionally pressed rewind. Upon pressing play, she heard her voice sounding the names of the tombstones that she had just passed. And so hearing the sounds of the reality around her played back, the sounds overlapped her real-time experience of the same space that she was walking. And so this process created what she referred to as this strange blending of technology and reality. Playing back the recording in the same space it was recorded created a peculiar effect within the practice of walking and listening. You walk and hear the sounds half a second later, Cardiff explained. So this delay or reverb sounded just out of time, adding this curious spatial overlay on the walker's experience. Forest Walk evolved from this opportune discovery 
of the spatial overlay effect, binaural sound and sound walking practices. And Cardiff experimented with editing layers and looping sounds onto audio tape. And she explained that this new method of combining sounds enabled her to shape the physical environment. You could just walk along and add sounds. It would affect what you saw visually, Cardiff recalled. She also mixed multiple tracks. And so on the first track, um, what was recorded was Cardiff walking through the forest, narrating the directions. The second was a mixture of short um, monologues recorded in the studio. And the others, the other tracks were composed of Cardiff's voice, dubbed film noir scores, musical samples and field recordings. Composed and loosely edited, the soundscapes formed an acoustic space that overlapped the walker's real-time experience. So Forest Walk begins behind the Walter Phillips Gallery. Once the walker presses play on the Walkman, Cardiff's voice, Janet, sounds close to the walker's ear. Janet's directions, um, Janet directs the walker to go towards the brown, brownish green garbage can. There's a trail off to your right. Take the trail, it's overgrown a bit. There's an eaten out dead tree. It looks like ants. The sound of Cardiff's footsteps sets the pace as she instructs the walker to follow her footsteps down a trail through a forest area leading to Bow River Falls. Walk up the path. I haven't been into this forest for a long time. It's a good way to get, it's good to get away from the centre, from the building noises to idyllic nature. Okay, there's a fork in the path. Take the trail to your right. Her observations and nature of the nature and her surrounds is interrupted by recordings of um, other sound effects a monologue recounts an encounter with an elk, fallen pine trees and darken, darkening skies. On occasion, a male voice, which is narrated by Miller, sounds. And so rather than forming a logical story, the words fuse layers of textural sounds in the highly directive yet ambiguous soundscape. And enmeshed within these voices are sound effects and field recordings of leaves rustling, birds chirping and the bowful rapids. But something else also emerges. The natural disintegration of the tape limits the effectiveness of her accurate directions. And indeed, the directions become increasingly difficult to follow as Janet's dialogue repeatedly describes fallen trees. Inevitably, not long after setting off down the path, the walker finds themselves unsure if the fallen tree described over the audio was the fallen tree that was in front of them or the one that they had just passed. So the walker's attention continuously shifts from one sound and direction to another. And so this walk becomes a multitasking event in which they attempt to negotiate the landscape, follow Janet's directions and piece together the story of the vocal narratives. Cardiff noted that when I listen to Forest Walk now, I can appreciate the freshness and the looseness, even with all the bad editing. But the bad editing was not all Cardiff's doing. As Alvin Lucier's I'm Sitting in a Room of 1969 has shown, the recording and re-recording of audio tape played and replayed over space and time sounded his voice into a grainy, unintelligible mess the more it was played back and re-recorded. Interestingly, in Forest Walk, the only indication that the walker is in the right position is when the recorded sound of Bow Falls synchronises with the rapids in real time. As the walker becomes preoccupied with trying to shadow the vocal directions and the pace of the footsteps, they become less att attentive to the audio mix. Evolving as a spatial and linear event, the walker negotiates the audio recording and the physical terrain. And at the same time, the walker and the headset, sorry, the walkman and the headset become mediators between the real and the recorded soundscape. 
So forest walk didn't fit neatly amongst electroacoustic and sound walking practices. However, it is, it is undeniable that these traditions are palpable in forest walk. I have explained how the use of audio technologies enabled Cardiff to form layers, space and depth with sound. And so this strange blending of technology and reality allowed the sound to behave first as a phasing effect and second as a spatial overlay intersecting the listener's physical space. The cassette recording became an orientation device, forming a spatial overlay on the walker's real-time experience. And by synchronizing the pre-recorded audio with the walker's real-time experience, this curious phasing effect formed. These experiments revealed for Cardiff, sounds potential as art instead of as new media or electroacoustics. This was a project of cross art form translation that became integral to Carter for Miller's practice over the next three or four decades. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone's got anything to ask. Very interesting presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, uh, your research or thoughts on the evolution of Cardiff and Miller's walking, sound walking practice over time after this um, really interesting um, initial experiment? Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Um, it definitely was. It was the first walk work that um, Cardiff did. And I guess in my research, what I've really sort of discovered is how her practice and her practice with Miller has transitioned along with the developments in technology. Um, and so at the start, obviously, at this time, it was cassette tape that she was working with. And then over time, that developed into CD Walkmans, um, and then as things progressed, it developed into the iPod, um, and it hasn't. It's developed into the audio iPod, and then the vid video iPod, and so these walks developed from being just audio walks to being what they referred to as video walks, where they combine video directions and sort of narratives as well as the audio and the binaural sound. But the another interesting thing is the fact that although technology has allowed them to become a little bit more fluent, and I, get be I guess better at mixing the sound and obviously adding the video, that nature of, of using binaural sound where her voice is implanted in the exact same spot um, as she's giving you the directions, that hasn't changed. But yet um, along with technology, the walks have developed um, and they've become a little bit better at giving, you know, she's become, Janet's become a little bit better at giving directions. Whereas with this walk in particular, I remember when I did the walk, you just had no idea whether you were following the directions or not. It was just, it was analog tape. So it was really sort of grainy and wasn't very clear. So I guess for me, that, that was the most sort of interesting um, part of my research was that um, sort of mirroring of technology as their, um, as their work has progressed. Okay, me again. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, what are your thoughts on the progression to the video sound walks? Do you think that that kind of takes away from the um, that kind of essential experience of sound and walking and the connection between them? Or do you see that as um, progress that is part of that kind of getting better as you, as you put it? Yeah, it's interesting. I think because another sense is added, the visual aspect is added to the video walks, I think what the video walks do is they make the walker a lot more confused about where they're actually going. And it takes the focus away from the, the oral um, aspect of the walk. So it's really interesting. It's although the video kind of, because you've got the visual cues, 
you're able to follow the directions because you've got the visual cues. So in one sense, it, uh, it makes it easier for you to sort of follow along. But in another sense, that added visual dimension really sort of plays with um, that, uh, that element of, um, I guess, our attentiveness to, to sort of what's going on. Um, and, and there's this sort of mixing of realities that kind of happens between what you're seeing on the screen and also what you're seeing around you. Um, it kind of just really plays around. It sort of plays around with your senses. Um, and Carter and Miller are highly aware of that. And I, and that's what they're trying to sort of, uh, I guess, get at in, in a sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. 